No, I'm uh, in Mumbai. Um, we are having this uh, women's IPL um, first week of November. So we are in the mandatory quarantine. Uh, I travel from my base that is Hyderabad in India, that's south of India. Mm -hmm. And we are quarantined for good eight, nine days here because all the girls come from different parts of the country. And uh, we've given so far two tests. So there's one more pending and then we will travel to UAE on 21st. Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, actually I'm in, I'm in a hotel room. Are you just stuck in your room or can you wander the yeah. hotel? Oh my God. No, no, no. It's a, it, it's a quarantine. So I can't leave the room. All oh. of us, like all of us are confined to the hotel rooms. Oh my God. Talk about crazy times. Well, I shall keep you company yeah. for an hour and let's have fun. Okay. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. When I was growing up here in the States, my dad and his friends would try to get the cricket matches on TV. I think they used to use pay-per-view or something like that. It was an event peppered with anticipation, snacks. I definitely remember stealing hot pakoras while they weren't looking and a lively atmosphere. And as you know, oftentimes key cricket matches happen to fall on odd hours here in the US. Part of me accepted and probably resigned to the fact that cricket seemed to be a men's sport. Of course, I did actually recently learn that there was a women's cricket team back in the 90s, but it wasn't televised and really no mention of it in the press. Women oftentimes even played supporting roles as fans of cricket. They'd prepare the snacks or sort of take a sideline fan approach. I didn't hear them rattling off statistics on players the way the men did. And looking back, I wonder if I chose to play tennis as a hobby instead of cricket because I actually saw female tennis players on TV and they were celebrated in the press way before even Serena Williams hit the scene. At about the same time in 1996, there was another little girl across the pond in the motherland India who, like me, was in school taking also Indian classical dance classes on the weekend and was pampered by her family. But unlike me, and probably, or well, I should say all of us listening, she was about to enter the professional world of cricket. And get this, it was at the tender age of 14. Today, I'm talking to none other than Mithali Raj. If you are a cricket fan, you already know her stats inside out. If you aren't, all you need to know is she's literally a living cricket legend. Today, we see young girls who not only can rattle off statistics of each cricket player, not only are they at the front rows of cricket games as avid fans, but they're actually interested in playing and possibly pursuing cricket as a career. We see women of all ages starting to take more serious interest in the sport. We see men leaning in as allies and actually just fans of like women's cricket. And while Mithali sits on the shoulders of women cricketers who have come before her, she indisputably has ignited an entire generation through her excellence and leadership. She is the only captain to lead the women's team of India to the ICC ODI World Cup final twice. She has the highest run score in international women's cricket, the only female cricketer to reach a milestone of 6,000 runs, 50 half centuries, the longest serving team captain with the highest success rate, and frankly, so many more accomplishments we'll get into. But first, Mithali, I heard you're a prankster and I love playing pranks on my girlfriends mm -hmm. and I need like massive inspiration. So I need to hear about some of the pranks that you played on your teammates. Well, um, I would say that a, a lot, I've done a lot of prank, uh, prankster stuff with my teammates, especially players who are of my own age group uh, way back. That would be good six, seven years back. Um, I did this uh, thing with Julian Goswami. She is, um, she's a tall, fast bowler in our team. And uh, I remember we played England in Guwahati. We finished the match in half a day. So we came back uh, to the hotel rooms after lunch. So we had the rest of the day off. And I was just lying on my bed, bed and I was thinking like, okay, what do I do for the rest of the day? It's quite boring in, in, a, in a place where, you know, it's all, um, Gohati is up north and a lot of tea estates around. So not much of, um, you, can, you can't really go outside as much. It's just scenery. So I said, okay, let me pull a, pull a prank. So those days, um, 
not much was mentioned in um, in in media in terms of women's cricket and uh, the matches were televised on doordarshan the national channel so not many knew about women's cricket and uh, bbc if bbc is taking an interview it's it's a big thing for all of us back then in early 2000s so um, i called up from my hotel room to her room and i said like you know i gave a bit of an accent and i said i'm calling from bbc and i would like to take an interview and she fell in the trap straight away and i was like okay let's go with the flow as an i i'll just take it along so i called a couple of more teammates and we we sat around the telephone and uh, i kept asking her all the questions and very innocently she answered everything and <laughs> um, and in between there were a couple of times that we we burst out laughing so i had to keep the phone down and then again i dialed her up so she's like what happened i said no it's a trunk call so you know isd call sometimes there is issue so network issues and she she bought that as well so we went on for good 30 30 minutes 30 to 40 minutes and then uh, i said okay and i i let you know when it comes out so as soon as she finished the interview she came out in the corridor and she uh you know called all of us and she said look look my interview has been taken by bbc and it will come very soon i'm going to call up my parents and tell them and that is when i was like you know okay it's, it's gone a little far she's going to tell her parents so i still had this stoic face but another teammate of mine amita sharma she's um, she's my uh, partner in these things she burst out laughing and then that's when julen understood that she was pranked and she didn't speak to me for a good 3 4 days she was like literally fuming she said how could you do this to me i said i didn't know i was just feeling bored couple of us are feeling bored so we just pulled a prank and you fell in it <laughs> oh my god so, that's yeah. hysterical <laughs> well if you ever need a partner in a prank when it comes to <laughs> interviews you can call me because i would love to help you play a prank <laughs> Yeah. That's hysterical. So that was fun. <laughs> well, as we're recording this, it is actually yeah, Sunday good. morning here in California and Sunday mm-hmm. evening in Mumbai where you are. Um, you know, I have a dance class in a few hours and you think okay. I would be nervous to interview you, Mithali, which I kind of was and I stalked you for 2 days straight researching in anticipation of our interview, but I'm honestly even more nervous for my dance class because I have not mastered the thigh that my Kathak dance teacher expects us to know. And <laughs> <laughs> and I know that you can relate because your first love was Bharatanatyam as well. Um yeah. and I think that's such an It's such an interesting place to start because that's really when your first great pivot happened mm-hmm. around that time and I was hoping maybe you could share with our listeners um your passion for dance and how that sort of led you to make the great decision to enter cricket. Well um <clears throat> dance is um I started dance very young when I was like good um 7 year old. and uh, dance classes were held in my own school premises so uh, every weekend we would have this dance teacher coming in and taking classes for the school girls and um, i i saw i happened to see it one uh, weekend on a saturday after the school ended so i told my mother like i would like to uh, enroll myself into dance class more than happy because mom had a bit of a background in terms of classical dance even she learned in her young days so she wow. she was more than happy that you know her daughter wanted to get into the same profession and uh, i i continued dance for good uh, till, till i was in my 10th standard cricket happened to me by chance i would say and uh, uh, you know i've always mentioned this that i was destined to be a cricketer because a lot of my journey um, in my life there were so many choices that i made has always uh, you know uh, was around cricket you know cricket was a priority or somehow i was always got closer to the sport even times when i thought i would just give up on it so cricket happened because my dad um, my dad is from uh, air force he was he's an ex serviceman he was an air force and you know like you know when you're in these um, in in this profession discipline is the top most thing that they follow everywhere so dad was a disciplinarian in at, at home and everybody at home were early risers my mother my father even my older brother all of them get up early in the morning and i would i would be the odd one out who would be like 
you know i love early morning sleeps and i hate getting up early and um, to inculcate this habit he said okay let's let uh, let her tag along uh, with with my brother i used to tag along in the mornings because he he was learning cricket back then in his school days so i used to tag along with him to the camp and he used to go and play cricket and i would solve math problems or do my homework at the ground so my dad would help me solve uh, problems so um that's how i was introduced to the sport and um if if given a choice or if you would have asked me at that point is is it something that i would want to be i would i want to be a sports person i would have said no because i i was never keen or interested into uh, becoming a sports person i was always interested in the cultural part of of a country like dance or paintings or all these things but never into sports so this happened to me and um, um as a young kid i was uh, my brother used to go to this academy which was an exclusive boys academy only boys you would see there and i would be the only girl sitting and fetching them the balls the tennis balls whatever came along and um, i remember my brother's coach one day he said okay this girl is coming every day let me feed her some balls so he gave me two three tennis balls and he said okay just whack it and uh, probably i um um did it well i guess he was quite impressed and then he called my dad he said i think it will be better if you focus on your daughter turning her into a cricketer than your son because she shows a lot of promise and there seem to be a lot of talent in her so i i guess that probably has propelled my dad to Uh, put me into this sport in 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 a more professional manner and uh, since then i have continued to play cricket as well as dance uh, both on a parallel way though it was very difficult for me but i continued it till a point where um, uh, i was picked for the world cup in 97 india was hosting the one day world cup so i was one of the standbys for the for the national side for the indian team and i was in school and uh, every month i would miss like good 15 20 days going for the camp because you prepare for the uh, world cup so every month we had like good 15 days of camp and in the process i would always fall back in my dance classes and the teacher never liked that each time i come back after a month i would be tanned and dark and she would like how can i apply makeup on such a tanned skin and she would like your class your group has already um gone forward and you're two classes behind so this happened on a regular basis and then there were times when you know i would get picked to do a show and my cricket tournament would collide with with the dates of the dance show so i had to pick one of it and dad always like you know okay you go and play cricket because you're almost there you're just one step uh, uh, you know ahead to represent your country so just give it a try and i would always choose cricket over dance so there was came a point when the dance teacher said like you know your daughter cannot uh, you know sail on two boats at a time she had to she has to pick one as a choice and one as a profession and um, dad being he he also played for services so he he is a cricket enthusiast and everybody are in india any any person you ask everybody who want their children to be cricketers so he said uh, you pick cricket whereas my mother never insisted that i pick dance but she gave she gave me a choice she said you pick what you want to do and um, i i think like as a young kid as a 14 year old when you're in school and you see your name splashed in newspaper and your t and your school mates you know come and applaud and, and treat you like this um you know like a superstar in the school you you enjoy that attention so i thought okay if if my name is coming and i'm doing well in this in this line let me continue to do, do it so that is one of the major choices or decisions i would say when i was at the crossroad to pick cricket and dance it happened in 97 and i chose cricket of course as a young kid i don't know the pros and cons what what at that point inspired me was the sort of attention i would get from my uh, schoolmates uh, you know performing well for the state and and higher level and uh, that made me choose a decision that you know i should get into cricket full time so that was uh, the year that i made a decision to take up this this sport as a profession It's crazy cuz to me your dad kind of sounds like the MVP here because in that moment 
I mean, it's rare. It's not like cricketers were making money, female cricketers, right? Like he's yep. telling you, and you're also making this choice because you use the word career. It wasn't like, oh, you were just really good at this hobby and you're going to pursue it till you go to college and maybe become a doctor or something. In your mind, it sounds like that was going to be a career option. And um, I think uh, what you said is right. In, in fact, in back in those days, not a penny that we earned playing cricket. It was yeah. purely on the basis of passion that all the girls, all the women who played in the 80s and 90s, it was purely out of their passion that they wanted to play the sport and were so truthful to it. There was absolutely no, um, what do I say? I, it, there was no professionalism in terms of monetary benefits that one can get out of playing the sport back then. Um, my dad... Uh, I do also ask him sometimes, I ask my mother as well, like, you know, back then you put, you invested everything into the sport, into a career for your young kid, young girl. And uh, did you ever feel that sort of a doubt, will she make it big? Or uh, will we ever get in return something, you know, right. you're spending so much. So uh, I guess what my mother told me is like, she said, we didn't know whether we will get anything in return but because we've never had that sort of a thought that, okay, we are investing so much, we should get something in return. For us, it was important that you represent the country where the, um, you know, the blue jersey that everybody dreams of wearing in our country. And uh, that was more important for us. So we've never really thought about the financial aspect coming from a middle-class family. I know that my dad had to do two jobs to, uh, to actually... Uh, fund me in terms of giving me the wow. best equipments. My mother had to let go her career in tourism because uh, each time when I came back tired from training or from tournaments, I would always want my mother around. And she she let go her career to be at home. And uh, even my brother, not many know that, you know, I have an older brother. People think I'm the only child of my parents because that much attention that I got from my parents to make uh, cricket as a career for me so my brother was like sort of a secondary but he never felt that he was left out in in fact I, I, I think he would be proud now to see his daughter see his sister achieve so many things and he's fine with it and and at some point I think um, your sibling when one uh, one child gets all the attention it is very natural for the second child to be a secondary position but he never felt or he never made it feel like he's been left out. Uh, though he's troubled me a lot in our younger <laughs> days, just like brother, sister. But as we grew, I think um, I have immense respect for him. And uh, coming from a South Indian family, yeah. my grandparents were never keen that, you know, I get into cricket, just leave cricket, a sport. He, they never wanted me to play sports because yeah. in, in, in our family, a lot of my cousins are into engineering and software and, and all that sort of a field. And here my dad like wanted his young girl to get into cricket. My grandparents were dead against it. And yet he, he continued to, um, you know, he, he wanted me to become a cricketer. He wanted me to represent the country, something which he could not do. He had his aspirations, but he probably couldn't do that. And he wanted to live that dream through me. And, um, and I, I think my mother really supported him in this decision. And as a young kid, when you are in a joint family and when you have grandparents who, who are not very keen that you, the girl, the grandchild or a granddaughter plays sport and uh, the parents are there to cocoon me from the negativity that you, you tend to face in your own family. And um, I never had to deal with these things because my parents stepped in to absorb a lot of it. And uh, all they made sure that, you know, I'm always given the positive vibes so I can focus on, on the task that is to become a cricketer. Your family, I mean, the Mithali Raj team, I feel like your parents and your brother were like your captains for sure. And that's just, I think, so cool to hear what a great impact parents can have on kids and even siblings, you know, to sort of pump each other up. I think that's so important. You know, you talk about money and I was going to bring this up later, but um, we have to talk about money because in <laughs> any profession for women without equal pay, yeah. frankly, nothing changes. And recently um, I interviewed Lisa Stilaker, 
who, uh, if you haven't heard her interview audience, you really have to listen to it because she's another, she's an actual OG in women's cricket. And what made my jaw drop, Mithali, when I talked to her was that she just mentioned on the fly that she had a day job. And then she would play cricket professionally. And I was like, hold on, we need to stop for a second. You're telling me you were a professional international cricket star who had a whole nother job. And um, that just like something about that sat with me for days. And I think that like, we all sort of know how much talent she has and how much she's done for the sport, but it really pissed me off. I mean, and so in preparation, when I was researching you, of course, like one of the Google search terms, which I'm happy to say wasn't just Mithali Raj boyfriend marriage, which is really annoying, (laughs) but was also your net worth, which I was excited about. And it's been reported and you don't have to confirm, but like it says multi-millions. And frankly, that really pumped me up. Because that is a game changer. The fact that you're getting paid to play women's professional sports, you're getting all of these like baller endorsement deals. Um, But you also sit at a very strange place. And I'm sure, and you sort of touched on this because when you started cricket, A, you clearly didn't pursue it to get rich and famous. Yeah, I'm sure your school is giving you adulations, but if there's no path that you're gonna make like some crazy Sachin Tendulkar money, it wasn't just for money. And somewhere in in your cricket career, all of a sudden women's cricket takes off and you start to make Mm -hmm. money. So like, I have so many questions there, right? Like. A, I mean, how did money come into play and how did that change for better and worse? And like, just like, let's just talk about money. I mean, because I'm sure you've thought about it. I mean, honestly, women being financially free also makes us make marriage be a choice, right? Like it's a choice. It's not like we have to get married to um, secure our future. And I, and, and so I just want to talk about all those things. (laughs) <laughs> well, um, to start with, I think uh, when I spoke about there was not there was not a penny in in women's cricket way back in nineties. Uh, I would like to put this on record to say that at that point of time in India, we were under a different association, which was called Women's Cricket Association of India (WCAI). So that association was running women's cricket in India, and the association was not financially very sound enough to organize series or uh, give us the best facilities, but it, it was somehow uh, with sort of running around for funds and sponsors, we would get some tournaments or some series in a year. And Lisa might be talking to you about, or she probably would have spoken about during those days as well, because she is from that, uh, that generation right. player. And um, talking in today, today's time, we are now under BCCI, Board of Control for Cricket in India, the richest board in the world. And, uh, you know, very fortunate to be playing and representing BCCI because we've come under BCCI's umbrella in 2006 and seven. So I think it, it changed a lot for women's cricket in India because then we've become professional cricketers in, in real terms. We didn't have to run about for sponsors, to fund our uh, international series. And uh, from 2015, I think we are contracted players, just like the men, we have gradings and um, we probably don't earn as much as them, but at least I think we are somewhere there because I think there has to be some start. And uh, the girls now are contracted player. As a contracted player, you have so many benefits. Like, you know, you, you earn playing for your country, there is match fees, there is um, uh, daily allowance, you travel uh, business class and you are put up in good hotels, you are given good um, grounds to play on, like stadiums, literally. Because um, I remember when I was, when I just started playing, I've played in parks, you know, literally there is no, there's no wicket as such. So from there to see women's cricket evolve and transition into today's time, where women's cricket is a brand in India. Each and every player have their own profile. They themselves are a brand. And that all happened is because coming under BCCI has changed a lot for women's cricket in India, where young girls now have a pathway where we have a good organized domestic structure. Playing domestic itself, you can earn because we have match fees even in domestic structure. 
and uh, BCCI now is taking keen interest to have India A emerging players, uh, under 19 Indian team. So when you have these things in place, for a young kid, you, you know, you, you know, like, you know, what is the stages that you have to cross to get into the Indian team, whereas this was not as organized under the WCAI. And after, uh, say, uh, becoming contracted players, you know, when a player is injured, you still know that, you know, you're under BCCI, you will be well taken care of. There is National Cricket Academy where men and women cricketers go for rehabs, which is, again, you have the best of physios and trainers and you have experts like, say, a batting coach or a bowling coach who can actually work on your game, give you that one-on-one um, -on -one time slot so that you can, they can actually invest their time into understanding your game. So when you have this kind of a, a structure under BCCI and as players, we benefit a lot in terms of not only standard or uh, not only in developing our sport and fitness level, but a lot of young girls come from a very humble background. So uh, the, they can take care of their family. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them's family depend on these girls' earnings. So they are literally like breadwinners for their family. And it's just not that. I mean, there are a lot of girls like, you know, after 20 to 23, when you know you have to earn money, this became a profession for them. They don't have to switch a profession and start um, looking, out, looking out for jobs, which was the case way back under WCI, way back in the 90s, because we were not earning money. So at one, some point, the family, the parents would say, okay, how long will you play cricket? You're not getting anything out of it. So I think you should start looking out for a job. So that way we've lost a lot of talented players back then. But now we have players, this is like a profession for them. They don't have to uh, go in search of another job where they can earn. They, they're earning by playing cricket, playing for the country. And that itself is a motivation for a lot of young girls to take up the sport. The sort of entertainment and the sort of um, thing that you get to see in IPL. Now, in, in maybe in a couple of years' time, you probably might get to see women's IPL come in. Why not a lot of young girls looking up to their role models on television and they would at some point want to wear that blue jersey or they want to play and, um, you know, they want to see themselves on television. So these factors can be a lot of, uh, can play the inspiration or say motivational factors for young girls. Yeah. I mean, it's, it feels like at some point you became Mithali Raj Inc. I mean, really, and I'm not sure, did you, I mean, you couldn't have known that that was going to happen. Was it like a gradual thing or was it all of a sudden, like, no, there's money coming into cricket and I need to figure it out. Like my brand and all these things. I don't, I don't know. Were you thinking about that? Because even pre-social media and pre-reality shows, I don't think that even like common people knew that you could become a brand having that in kind of the zeitgeist did did you know was it gradual or did it feel overnight well um you know i'm one of those fortunate players who've seen the uh, pre and post bcci or the transition in women's cricket from the 90s into coming under bcci and the and, and the sort of changes that we, we got to see and be part of it. I'm, I'm very fortunate and grateful to be still playing. And um, as far as talking about uh, the change, the brand, yeah. um, honestly, I've never really dreamt or even it never crossed my mind to think yeah. one day, okay, I would be endorsing a brand or, you know, uh, the matches will be televised or at some point I would, uh, I would see people uh, having a, a roundtable conference where, you know, when it comes to cricket, they just not talk about men's cricket. Women's cricket is also part of the conversation. Because, uh, uh, as I said before, that a, a lot had to do with when, uh, you know, in terms of visibility. You were talking about seeing the tennis players, exactly. women tennis players already on television. So it was very natural for you to take up tennis. Back then, you probably didn't see women's cricket on television to understand that, okay, there is women's team, you know, in, in, in Australia, in England, playing the sport. So it is, it, is, it is very similar in India as well. A lot of, a lot of men would associate cricket with men's cricket for a long period. And uh, only when we got into the 2017 World Cup, when the matches were televised, and when we got made it to the finals, I mean, the sort of social media was taken by storm seeing Indian team getting into the finals of the World Cup. 
so the sort of attention we got from everybody around the world literally i was told the finals was the uh, most watched women's uh, match ever so wow. i think uh, that has actually changed everything and and a lot of credit goes to the way uh, the boards have uh, publicized or marketed the tournament in the social media like the icc and bcci they have marketed it well for people to understand okay look the indian team is playing in the finals so let's root for it and coming from india where you know cricket is a religion i mean you would understand the sort of support that we got back from india and everything changed for us after the world cup people started to recognize us when we go into stores or when you're sitting at a restaurant people um, associate us with the with, with the sport and then there's so so many brands who've come forward where they want the players the women players to endorse the brands so i think it is it's in a good way it is it is a growth and it will only get better and better but again at the end of the day one should understand that we are all uh, playing a sport it's important that we keep performing because people love uh, players and teams which keep performing yeah i mean that's the same in business right i mean for better or worse it's about results but i have to yeah. ask like you were clearly equally talented let's say 10 years earlier but maybe you were less recognizable on the street and now mm -hmm. you're like you're famous and you're not insta famous you're like cricket bona fide famous so is it bizarre are people like when people started to stop you more often was it weird and how did you feel about that that's got to be such a bizarre experience well initially i was um, i'm an introvert so i would feel really shy and uh, and you know i wouldn't know how to react there are times yeah. when you know i would like okay uh, there's so many people coming in i wouldn't know what to do but i i guess like you know uh, you need to accept and change with times they say you know so i started to accept the fact that okay the dig digital platform is in thing now that's the thing and uh, people recognize you accept it it should be part of your life so it took me a while definitely yes because as i said i'm i'm one of those players from the past generation so uh, for me to understand and accept the uh, accept social media it took a while but um i think now it is important that we understand that it is it is a way of interacting with your fans getting closer to your fans and and at some level in even promoting the sport because what is happening anywhere else in the world you're able to see those matches on social media maybe the clippings and what is happening around the globe so uh, information is in, in in you know in split seconds you are able to uh you know get it so I, i i guess it's important that one utilizes in in the best possible way and not to be controlled by it mm -hmm. that is very important so I important mean, you, yeah you shouldn't be controlled and and a lot of them say trolls and everything but i guess it comes it's it's a whole package there are people genuine fan followers that i have uh who who are very appreciative but at the same time you'll also have people who would who would not like anything of yours so you can't really delete anything but accept it both as part of it you know a lot of people like here in the US like you hear all the time about NFL players like football players here mm -hmm. like they go they get all this money and they go bankrupt and like you know all this stuff and so but you're so grounded and it did happen sudden without any plan without any role model mm -hmm. really in women's cricket for how to handle fame money all this sort of stuff so what's the foundation that you sort of fell back on was it your family or like was there somebody else in your life that kind of helped you navigate that time i um i have a very uh, small unit of people in my in my personal life yeah. and um, of course my parents are there but i also have uh, friends from school and a friend from cricket uh, and uh, they are sort of a mentor to me one of my friends uh, prajita who have played on the 19th with she was a coach and then she's she's now by professional lawyer but um she's someone who's really worked on my mental setup even the emotional side of it because something like um the sort of uh, appreciation that we got after the 2017 world cup it hit me like a jolt in all honesty i would have to admit it that you know i wasn't prepared for the stardom 
Mm. And um, at at one point for good two three months, I never got to see my parents living in the same house. And uh, at some point, you know, my mother broke down saying that you know things have really changed. Um, I'm not able to see my daughter who's living in the same house. So I, I guess even I was struggling at the same time to understand how how things have changed uh, in a span of a week after the. Right after the world cup that's so and, trippy uh, i can't even yeah. imagine like that how that could happen because by the way it's not like you got famous over something notorious it was something a craft you'd been working on for so long it had existed right so that's yeah. even the crazier part of it to me so it's for say for for uh, players who are the current generation who's already with the social media it's easier for them to accept it but for somebody right. who's way back in the 90s who've seen like there was no mobile phones at one point we were pretty much banking on the landlines and right. coming to a point where today we have social media everything at the tip of the finger it did take me a while but i think my friend like uh, my mentor aprajita really worked on my uh, mental setup and uh, at one point i felt like you know okay what is this change happening i'm not able to accept it that's when she told me she said this is part of it you should be able to now try and absorb it and try to learn to um accept the recognition accept that people are going to uh talk good about you and the day you don't perform there will be criticism but you should be able to differentiate uh, constructive criticism and uh, and and try to be relevant with the standard of your sport and that is the topmost priority for you these things will keep coming you keep performing these things will come but uh, she made me realize that no matter what at some point you have to fall back on your mechanism your support mechanism that is your family because at the end of the day they have seen me grow they've seen the tears that i've shed uh, the the hard work that i've put in the times uh, when i have not scored runs it's my family and my friends who've been around so uh, i've always gone back to them if if ever i felt like um in in a sort of my emotional equilibrium is not there you know i would always bank on them because i know that they would give me a very honest opinion of whether you know i'm doing the right thing or not and they have helped me to understand and again prioritize things mm -hmm. you know it yeah. was quite easy for me back then in the 90s to only play cricket that was just it there was no distractions right there was absolutely no distractions but with visibility with seeing myself on television there's so many people are watching and what they are watching i can't say and i don't have control over it what control i have is to perform to perform to the best of my ability and at the end of the day i should know that i've given my best and help my team to do well and i should take a, a lot of confidence from that yeah one of the most relatable things I heard you say in some other interview, which totally made me laugh because I kind of do the same thing. And I have a 13 year old and he's like a champion debater. So I do it for him too. But that you put notes of affirmation and motivation kind of all yeah. over. Um, clearly, whatever you're writing on there, Mathali works. So I need to know what is on there. <laughs> <laughs> well um see i'm i'm no different i'm not like a superhuman i have my mm -hmm. own vulnerabilities uh, i have i have uh, worked uh, you know i do feel sometimes i have self doubts on my own ability it's it's bound to happen we are all humans and these are the emotions which we all feel at some point closer to the tournament sometimes we we don't we are not in good space so we stress we have uh, we feel anxiety and all of these things so affirmations is probably i realized one of the ways for me to keep reminding that i'm good so what i do is in the hotel rooms when i work closer to the tournament i keep these affirmations on 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 the places in the hotel in, in my room wherever i visit often that is uh, you know the washroom and the, as soon as i get up the first thing where i see as soon as i get up from sleep that's where i paste it or the books that i read the first page i paste the affirmations saying that at at time times like you know okay i'm the best i worked i worked i prepared well trust your instincts so, so some of these words uh, actually resonate with the thoughts that you have so it's always good to have them or see them around 
um you know or uh, you know the more you see the more uh, you s- sort of extract confidence i would say from that and yeah. you keep reminding yourself like you know you're good you're good so uh, you know the body also syncs with your mind and it's very important people forget that sports is so important in sports uh, it's just not about body or it's just not about mind both have to sync for you to do well the skill is very much related to your uh, emotional and mental space that you are in in your mind the more clear and more clarity you have the more composed you are and that is a space they say that you know the sports people you know when you play you are in that zone that yeah. zen zone that, that you know where your body state. takes over yeah. yeah so that is because you are very calm you are composed and you allow your body to do the work that it knows best Yeah, having a good sort of mindset, I feel like everything you're saying of course is so key to professional sports, but really in any sort of field of excellence, I think it's so important. You know, I've mentioned this before on my show, but I think it bears repeating that in 2018, Ernst and Young surveyed all these like high-level executives and they found that 90% of women that they sampled played sports whether it was in high school or college, and among women currently holding a C-suite position so that means ceo cmo something that's like a chief this rose to 96% and my mind was kind of blown when i heard that and then indra nui who was a ceo of pepsico and satya nadal who's a ceo of microsoft i also heard that they both played cricket in college and they both talk about openly all the time at business conferences about how the lessons they learned playing cricket is what really served them off the field when they were building their companies and taking on leadership roles. And so I feel like Mithali from you we could get like the biggest masterclass in leadership um because something I really was so relating to you about so I'll take you back for a second. I first became a boss I was 23 and I was really good at my job so I was really pumped mm-hmm. that I was going to be able to like manage people, right? The ego at 23 as well, but I realized pretty quickly that being really good at my job function didn't make me necessarily a good leader or managing people that were older than me or even anyone who is my peer. Um and so I really related to you when I you actually turned down the captaincy which by the way I think is interesting because it reminds me of other women in the corporate ladder who turned down promotions which I think is fascinating. I don't know Yeah, I don't know have men ever done that in cricket and like no, I don't want to be the captain. I don't think I'm ready. I don't know, but I think that's interesting. So I'd love to get I mean, obviously you've been such a successful captain too. Like your whole thoughts on leadership and, you know, teach us. Teach us your ways, Mithali. <laughs> <laughs> well, um yes, I did turn down captaincy when it was first offered to me because I remember going to this uh, tournament. I was just leaving home and uh, my dad who probably had this sort of uh, uh, knowing the future, he said like, you know, if ever they appro- if if ever they offer you captaincy do not say no he specifically told wow. me i said yes dad i will do that i was i was probably um 20 or 21 year old <clears throat> so um i um and and then we i i went on on to on for the domestic domestic tournament and um, i was i was a deputy for two years from say 2002 to 2003 and 4 and uh, this offer came to me in 2003 and i remember like you know when when the selector when the chief selector asked me she said um you know we are keen to make you the captain so i was like <laughs> i was honestly i knew that my dad said don't say no but somewhere deep within i felt i wasn't ready for it and if i accept it i probably would make him happy but i would be struggling inside because i know that's that's not the right um uh, right answer to it so i i told her i said uh, i don't want to lead i was i was 20 year old i said i don't want to lead and she was taken aback because probably i mean who would turn down to lead your national side who would turn down to lead indian team and i was like i said i don't want to lead she said any specific reason i just said i said i just feel that i'm not ready i don't have any other reason than this but i just feel so from within 
and um, she said fine so i came back to the room i told my teammates i told my friend my best friend nushin i said she approached me for captaincy and i turned it down she's like what have you done <laughs> and she was like you know how who can ever turn down captaincy i said but nush i think it's it's not the right thing when you know something you know you're not ready so she's like no go back and tell her that you know you are ready i said but i'm not ready she's like we will manage everything so i was again coaxed into it like you know to accept it and somehow i went back but but then the chief selector knew okay she's been uh, you know forced or influenced to take her decision back but i i guess that is one of the best decisions that i've done because uh, the team was in, in in a state where it needed a, a very matured head and probably i was not ready to accept uh, a team where you know we have ex captains playing you know so it's it's a very different setup if you had t if you had players of your own age who played with you in under 19s and under 23 it's a different um, it's a different thing but when you have two three ex players ex captains and uh, senior players in the side then for a young player a rookie captain to understand the dynamics of the team is very difficult so when the team was going through the transition after the 2000 world cup it needed somebody who was who was um as i said matured enough to understand these things and get the team again together so i i was still uh, retained as a deputy but those two years gave me um a sort of an education i would say in understanding the senior players uh, the ex captains so when i was again given captaincy in a year's time for 2005 world cup i was ready to take it up and having the same seniors having the same ex captains under me i was in a better space to uh, relate to them to make them comfortable knowing how to um, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, deal with uh, senior players and players of my age group or players younger than me so um, i would still say i was not experienced captain but i know that you know i can i i am i'm there to learn and take the team along so my first outing as a captain was in the 2005 world cup where we were runners up so that itself says that i was very fortunate to have a team which you know everybody played their role and i had a had a i had a senior team so i would say as a captain i didn't have much to do but my challenges as a captain started after that after the 2005 world cup when there were a lot of changes in the side when the senior players players left and when the young players came in so that's when you know i became a senior player now it was my responsibility to take care of the young players the junior players to build a team and i did a lot of mistakes i did i would accept that i've i've learned from those mistakes it was important for me to do those mistakes and learn from it because no matter how much you study there are so many manuals on leadership but leadership is a very individual thing every person who's given the responsibility of leading a group of uh, you know uh, players or people i think they come up with their own setup and everybody are unique in their own qualities so as a leader um it was even my uh, journey i would say i've learned a lot i was uh, for good 2 3 years i w- i was sacked in 2007 as as a captain i came back in 2013 so those 3 years it made me understand why um or where i went wrong the initial periods of my captaincy when i was young i gave a lot of time to other things like um you know lot what people are saying about my captaincy okay okay i have, i would take suggestions from everybody and everybody have everything to do about things everyone have their own views and everything and i started to give them more time more energy to those things when i again came back in 2013 as a captain i understood that there are only few things that i would like to give my energy to and that and the foremost thing is to build a team to build a team for the 2017 world cup those four years are important for me to uh, get the player identify players who are who can be a match winners uh, players who uh, with a little bit of confidence can actually be turn things around for the team identify these players and get them to be a cohesive unit and give them that confidence because i mean when everything goes well i mean everybody are happy but when things go wrong that's when my leadership comes forefront 
that's when it is important that i keep the team together make the players understand they are equally important i'm i i might be the captain but uh, i am just as good as my team if if my team is not doing well and you know i still think that okay i'm the boss it makes no sense to me it's important for me to make them realize they are equally important and at the same time give them space to grow that is also important a lot of time what we do is like as a captain the initial phases i would say okay just follow this because i am saying it because i am the captain that was my setup when i just got the captaincy but later on when i was sagged and when i was again brought back i understood that okay it doesn't work like that every player has a different way of dealing with things and um, because indian team a lot many players come from different backgrounds some come from cities some come from districts interior parts of a country a lot of them are not exposed to, to a lot many things at the international level so as a captain then it's important for me to understand that i cannot have one way for everybody there are different ways of dealing with different players so uh, a lot have learned uh, in terms of my leadership i'm still learning it's still something that you can always learn and um, i i i guess the most important thing that i have learned personally is compassion um to understand and give space to my players sometimes everybody have those moments on 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 the ground when we are because everybody are passionate about the sport so there is emotion in it sometimes emotions just run out you know then you how do you handle that on the field some some players are aggressive some players they don't express much but they still feel the anxiety so as a captain if i can understand those things i'll be able to use my resources much better and that is something you learn on the job you learn being with the players and spend more time with them to understand them off the field because a lot what you do in your day to day life the way you deal with things on a day to day basis is what you carry on the field we can't have twin personalities we are what we are and that's what we carry on to our game field and for me a lot of my homework goes on understanding the players of the field how they train in the training sessions that's when i see which player is more committed or what they are trying to do that's where i do a lot of homework so on the field it is more about planning and strategies and uh, how to utilize which player at which uh, which down or when a lot i mean there's so many beautiful gems in there that are so applicable in leadership everywhere but one of the things that you said is basically it's about bringing your whole self to yeah. your let's call it job profession whatever and I feel like there's a new breed of women leadership where they're so thoughtful of that. So many of like the best female CEOs I've spoken to recently, literally I could just exchange you and you're saying very similar things. And I think that's so important because I think what we've realized is that that emotional kind of IQ is so key to making really good decisions as a leader. Um, you know, but uh, we were playing Monopoly at home the other mm -hmm. night and um, I, we need your leadership because we get super worked up and if one of us doesn't win it's really bad so i i it got me thinking when knowing that i was going to talk to you i mean how do you deal with those tense moments when like really you put in all the work that you can and let's say like in the world cup as a runner up like where does that resilience come from and when you're a leader when you yourself must be i mean let's be honest disappointed that you that you're runner up how do you then rally your entire crew to be like no we've got this see um when you're runners up yes it is uh, i would say that people would uh, say okay you're the world cup runners up you're still number 2 but then the 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 people who are in number 2 will understand how close they were to becoming number 1 right. and uh, the pinnacle of of championship is the world cup trophy and we lost by 11 runs so it really pinches i mean it took good uh, months to get over the fact that you know we were so close to actually getting our hands on the cup and we we let it go but um it it also takes a lot of courage to understand where we went wrong and see that we we work on it and um that is something the the girls have done if you see our post the 2017 world cup the icc championship uh series that we've played um 
we out of i think eight series we won seven series um you know at playing at home or playing abroad on a different soil i think that itself reflects that the team want is wanting to do well and the coming and the coming world cup one day world cup the team is ready to put those hard yards to get across to being the number one team so that is something we are working on and um, i think it is important that uh, people should understand when when you when you're working towards your goal a lot of us it is bound to happen that we are always thinking about the end thing okay they say that you know okay keep keep thinking that you're going to lift the cup lift the cup but not many understand that there is a lot of work needs to be done in reaching that precise moment of lifting the cup and that and that uh, journey is what we call the process and um, how important it is to focus on your process because you're preparing and i truly believe that uh, the only thing that we have in control is our preparation because that's where you know how to prepare you know where to prepare what happens on the field i have no control it's the situation and i have to um, you know uh, be the best that i can in that situation and deal it but i cannot foresee that situation and prepare but preparation i know okay this is what i need to do this is this is my strength i have to amplify it and this is my weakness i still have to work on it so preparation is in in my control and that is something i will try and focus to be uh, more purposeful and more meaningful a lot of times i've seen some players they don't show that energy in 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 the training sessions they like okay they drag themselves into training sessions so sometimes you need to give them a pep talk you need to give them tell them that this is where you need to invest your energy this is where your passion is if if training you do well that is something you carry into your match but in training itself you're dragging yourself in the match when you actually want to hit a ball or when you actually want to perform in the way you do you you're not in sync yeah so i think it's 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 important that one understands the process is what everybody needs to focus on and there will be ups and downs it's it's uh, there is nothing which is perfect there is no perfect preparation there is no perfect uh, situation and there will always be something that you're not prepared for but that is the beauty of the sport it's very uncertain it it challenges you that is that is for everybody to deal with it's just not as a you everyone in in this field has to deal with the uncertainties but um, but i think uh, what you can control is the way you prepare yourself the best and at any given point always have faith that you know you have you have the ability to pull it through yeah no matter how how difficult the situation is or no matter how uh, how your day goes it's it's very important to have faith and the hope that things will get better and that will pull you through because it's like you know the you're holding with just one nail at the cliff you know it's it's the hope it's the faith that keeps you alive to to allow you to put that extra energy or extra um you know uh, push in your performance when you actually need it is that what's kept you in the game so long like almost two decades that's a lot mithali and it's amazing but is that what's kept you going well i think of um, at different stages in my career i had different uh, motivation factors yeah. like when i when i first made it into the indian team Uh, for me to where the just to play for india was a motivation and yeah. when i started playing for india i wanted to cement my place or be the main player for india so that was a motivation so once you start scoring runs i wanted to be consistent and consistency is something i've always been motivated with because um Pause. You know, so I'm going to pause because i want everyone <laughs> to hear that i think that's such important advice consistency is so i mean literally we've heard that so many times but here you are two decades later baller still doing so amazing and you're saying the secret to your success is essentially consistency so i really want people to take that in well yeah i think uh, i've seen a lot of players who who come in a flash for 2 3 years exactly. they're really good and then suddenly they disappear you know after 2 3 years so uh, i didn't want you to be that player if i'm going to play each time i held a bat i had to score runs whichever team that could be it could be 
district side um it could be my district side or its indian team a, my coach has always told me in the initial years of my career he said uh, when you hold a bat i would want you to score i would want you to score a 50 and it it doesn't matter where you play it doesn't matter whether it is international series or a, or a, or a good fun game backyard or a tennis ball it doesn't matter to me but i would want to i want you to be just as competitive as you will on 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 any international game so that developed in me that you know each time okay he said that i have to score runs so what is required of it is that each time i train i train as though like i'm playing a match so my commitment in my training is just as much as I, i would on any international game so for me training and and the game and the competition game is no different it's just very similar so if yeah. i am going if i am going to train the way i'm going to play in the match and not get out in the nets i know that, i know that in the match i will carry the same um mental setup or the same focus i don't have to i, have to, I don't have to train uh, differently to get that focus because i am anyway focusing my mind along with my skill in training session to carry it into the match uh, match day so a uh, consistency when i talk about consistency consistency is also how you focus it's not yeah. like okay it's a tennis ball game so it doesn't matter if i get out no consistency matters then that you know you still have the same focus irrespective whether it's a cricket ball or a tennis ball or a girl bowling or a boy bowling or whether you're playing in a park or you're playing in the stadium it doesn't matter as long as you're holding a bat and you're playing the skill that you're uh, identified with it should be the best that you can play i i mean i think that's amazing advice so i have two questions there which is do you have any specific focusing techniques that you've utilized over the years and then the other part of that is other than just also your mind and your mental mode which i think is so important obviously realistically your body too i think there's so much more science now of how mm-hmm. to um to recover I hope now you're a big believer in sleep because we now know that's so so important to our recovery <laughs> process but yeah. like teach us a little bit of, about that too because I think all of us are trying to um have longevity and higher quality of life as we age and I mean you're obviously doing it at a professional athlete level Well I think it's important when I say focus it it, it doesn't mean like the entire day because right. human mind can focus only for a limited period otherwise we get mentally drained so then we are in 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 no uh, way to uh, uh, accept knowledge or accept more information so i think when it comes to cricket where you know as a batter between the balls is a time when i relax and when the when the bowler starts again for those few um say those two minutes or a, or a few seconds i am in intense focus so uh, that is something that you again work it's a very individual thing but uh, when i'm training i only focus on training so there is a way they say that compartmentalize your mind right when and when i talk about purpose and meaningful training it means that that when i'm training i'm only thinking about training i don't think about okay i have an interview set up or i have to go to my aunt's place or i have to do this chore so i don't think in those things because then you're you're actually um releasing or leaking energy into other things and then you're not able to get your mind back to focus and that usually what happens in the game is that when you're tired uh, you're you you're you so you struggle to focus and that's mm-hmm. when you know you let go and you get out or you misjudge something you misjudge a situation and uh in training that is what i do and that helps me in the match but there are also times despite doing all this i do still feel the anxiety or the pangs that you feel before a big game or before playing the first ball it is very natural playing for 20 years i still get those butterflies in my stomach for the first 5 10 balls that i face so um i've um, i came up with my own uh, uh, way of dealing with this anxiety is reading a book before a game and i don't i don't watch the game live i am i'm in the dressing room i i i'm ready to go into bat but i pick up a book and read so that i divert my mind not onto the match which is which is going on of course i'm aware of the situation but um, i'm shifting my focus in a way that when i get my opportunity to bat i'm fresh i don't go with a 
uh, preconceived notion, okay, the bowler is bowling like 150 kilometers too fast, or we've lost two wickets, we are under pressure. So these thoughts should not be going into my mind when I'm walking into bat. When I walk into bat, when the walk is from the boundary to the wicket, I need to compose myself. I need to, again, um, revisit those affirmations that I write on, 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 the, on the hotel room that, you know, I'm good, I'm best, ir irrespective of the situation, I can deal with it. So if I have to be in that situation, I, I can't be going in with a preconceived notion, okay, this is a situation, what will happen? I can't question my ability. And that is why what I do is when, when you're reading a book, your mind is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I walk into bat, I know my mind is uh, free of all the uh, prejudices they would say when you're actually watching the game. You know, you go in with a fresh mind, open mind. Okay, this is a situation and I'm going to deal it with the best of my ability. Simple, keep it very simple because mm -hmm. when, you, when you're in, in, in a difficult situation, it's very difficult to be simple and calm. But that is something you need to work on. And it, the easiest way is to break down things and keep and remind your body and your mind. Simple things that, you know, okay, I'm good enough. I've done my job. I've done my preparation. I've done my training. I've done the hard work. And I, I have um, confidence that, uh, you know, I'll pull off. I'll pull, I'll pull through this situation. So when you keep talking like this, you know, your body responds that much better. Yeah, there's lots of science to that. We've had, uh, by the time your episode airs, we'll have had Dr. Tara Swart. She's a neuroscientist and um, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. She talks a lot about, it. she actually gives the science behind exactly what you're saying. So you're definitely onto something. And it's funny that you bring up the book because in watching um, footage of you, I mean, dude, you look like you could be wearing jammies, having a face mask. It's not that you're just reading a book, Mithali. You look calm and just chilled out. So two things. Hey, what the heck are you reading that makes you that calm? Because I need to read that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think reading, a lot of people asked me about uh, reading. Reading yeah. is something I developed later in my career. Um, because as, as at one point when we were under WCI, we traveled a lot by train and train journeys are long in India. If you have to travel from South to North, it would take good 24 to 26 hours. Before you were so business what, class. <laughs> yeah. Before we got into business class. So I guess, uh, that is when I realized, okay, what one does in a train journey when you have to spend like 24 to 26 hours, how yeah. much can you talk with your co-passenger or how much can you sleep? So yeah. I decided to pick books and I started to read and that's how I developed the habit of reading. And when you pick some interesting books, you continue to read and you don't even know that, you know, <laughs> you, you spend a lot, many hours in that. And um, I remember the few games which I played for my state side and I, I go at number three, one down batter. So the openers used to play good 20 hours as I would be ready and waiting for my turn and it would take hours. So I was like, okay, the best thing to do is pick up a book and read and wait for my turn to come. And that's how I um, started to read. And I started with crime. I started mm. with Sydney Sheldon because that is something everybody can relate at some point and enjoy reading. Yeah. And then I got into uh, biographies. And now I think I've, I've got that, you know, I'm, um, I really like fantasy genre yeah. because um, I really enjoy reading those books. It's uh, at uh, many levels, I feel that uh, we connect with the storyline because there is a hero or a heroine or, you know, the main character. Initially, they they don't accept their destiny, that this is meant for them. They always like, you know, rebel and they don't want to do it. But at some point, they're attracted to the destiny and, and things work for them. But at the same time, they are not the only ones who are, um, uh, at the end, of course, they are, they are the ones who are the heroes but they always have a support system. There's always a friend or an uncle or somebody who's always helping them when in the most difficult times. You know, like the Lord of the Rings, you know, the Sam, mm -hmm. the, the character of a Sam is so important. He's not the hero, but then he is, he is someone that, you know, uh, the character that uh, supported uh, the main character so well at a time when the most important decision he had to make. You know, that is when that Sam as a character, he's played such an important role. And that is what is there in everyone's life. Whoever made it big 
will always have somebody in the background somebody in the shadows who always you know held them from the back from falling so uh, nobody achieves anything alone in this world it's 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 a uh, i don't believe in that concept we are we always are dependent on others and we will always be dependent on others the stories that you're reading sound pretty familiar to <laughs> us <laughs> now i know where you're getting your blueprint um you know to me and literally billions of people mithali you prove that um talent is everywhere but opportunity isn't so while you may have not pursued your dance career mithali you created a gigantic stage for yourself and made it so big and so inclusive and so bright frankly that now women from all over this planet have somewhere to perform in the world of professional sport. So for that, I thank you. I'm sure the world thanks you. Future generations of not only cricketers, but I mean women doing so many things. Thank you. So just thank you Mithali for everything that you're doing and um you now have a really new hardcore fan girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. thank you thank you alexandra because i enjoyed talking and um revisiting those old days and um i, I guess like we all um you know if we can be the support system to women from different fields i enjoy uh, following uh, women athletes from different uh, other uh, sports as well they have done brilliantly for their own sport to grow and being the role models for young girls and at a time when in india i remember if if you have to connect sports it was always men yeah and today you have so many women athletes as role models in different like badminton tennis cricket so it's it's good to see and um, and, and people are also accepting women as athletes you know that is that is the most important change that i have seen um and young girls today i see a lot of young videos being posted in social media where the young girls are good like 5 6 year olds are holding the bat and playing so i think it's it's good to see such young kids who now are coming out of the shadows to actually voice that you know they are passionate about sport they are passionate about a sport like cricket and they would want to um, play play the sport because uh, they they like it simple and they have a road map they have a pathway now under bcci and i think uh, that is great for the sport and it will only get better i would say in the coming years the women's ipl in a couple of years time with the under 19 world cup i think this sport is growing yeah and i mean i think it's it's not even just a sport mithali which obviously without a doubt undisputably like you said cricket cricketers are like god in india but it's like it's like the symbol you know like we need so many symbols that really that we can do anything and even though cuz what was so cool about you in my opinion is that you didn't necessarily see a woman cricketer i mean to your point you were doing math problems at your brother's cricket practice so somewhere you created this vision or luck or destiny or an amalgamation of all of it but you were able to really be a pioneer and yes there were others but you were your own pioneer first again right so mm -hmm. i think that's so inspiring so thank you so much just for sharing yourself and i hope you keep doing that and i hope you do keep using social media as a platform because i think that more people will be able to discover you and they need to yeah i will i, I think um i i would like to say here that you know during the 2017 world cup um initially when when i got into social media i had a fan following of this 2000 odd on the twitter and i was like okay this is a new thing and i was still not hooked to it and i didn't yeah. know how to uh, sort of operate it and between uh, and uh, during the world cup my twitter handle was hacked and i was like i didn't know like i was thinking who the hell has so much of time to hack into my handle and that's when one of my teammates said welcome to stardom because now you're famous that's why people are spending time to hack your twitter account so that was sort of a, you know intro, intro into this whole uh, face of celebrity or stardom where you know the first thing they do is hack your twitter handle Well, I, I guess it's, it's a great it. uh, platform. <laughs> you made it. I guess, I guess yeah. that's the new thing. 
saying like, someone please hack my Twitter account so I can feel like I made it. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, I think it was, it was fun, but um, I, I think it's, it's a good platform. As I said earlier, also in the interview, if we use it well and wisely and for good purpose, I think it's the best platform where you reach out to people, um, appreciate people for the, uh, 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 you know, uh, various work that they are doing and you're up to date with the current affairs and if need be reaching out and giving a pep talk or a confidence and tweet for some people encouraging them I think it's the best, best platform as long as we use it um, wisely yeah and not getting judged by the likes so I think the difference between you and so many other people using social media is they start to really internalize you know, I didn't get like 50 likes on this photo or what have you. So I think when you say, when you said that earlier, I think that's like key. You can't get caught up in what the reaction is going to be. I mean, I think you need yeah. to look at it as an extension of the type of energy you want to put out into the world. And I think that is, is the best way to utilize social media. So I, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. I guess I could talk to you forever, Mathali. <laughs> I'll let you go back being yeah. like the legend that you are. So it's a wrap, people. <laughs> a reluctant wrap, <laughs> but it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mathali. This is yeah. awesome. I'm